we're going to pick up because uh, the recording at church fails, so we're going to uh, have an intimate study, I guess, you and I, uh, on the parables. We're doing the parables, and so we're going to move on to parable number 11 in our series, and, uh, and this one will uh, discuss what happens at the end of the kingdom as the kingdom's breaking through. This is the sequence of things that's going to occur, and so it should be consistent with other pictures as we go. Um, and you remember that uh, in this uh, picture there's many consistencies in the parables that what's a seed in one parable is a seed in another etc etc so that there's consistency in the parables of Jesus parables so we're going to read this one first and we'll go from there so it's um we're going to go Matthew 13 47 and it says again the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind which when it was full they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so we go from there. Now when we're looking at this, remember the parables, they correlate, they interrelate, um, and, so, and they parallel one another as well, so some of them. So uh, when we're reading this verse, or these verses regarding that parable, we also want to have a look at uh, another story that occurred in Jesus' life uh, in John 21. So if you've got your Bibles there, uh, let's go through to John chapter 21. And when we go to John 21, uh, okay, and it's verse 4. And it says, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, Yet his disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he'd removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in uh, the little boat, uh, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish, notice the words, some of the fish, uh, which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153 and although there were so many there was not uh, the net was not broken Jesus said to them come and eat breakfast yet none of the disciples dared ask him who are you Lord knowing that it was the Lord Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish and so we have these two stories that actually run together uh, with one another and so um, so they will shed some light on the story that we're looking at there so parables are a story, of course they're a story, uh, but it's a story about uh, an actual event. It's not just an allegory that you can draw things in and out of. It's actually Jesus telling a story, but the story relates to an actual, actual event. The parable is not an actual event, but the parable illustrates an actual event. And so there's some things here that we need to flesh out. Now when we look at the end of the age, um, if we have a look in Romans, uh, Romans 11 and verse 25, what is the end of the age that he's talking about? If some of the translations there when we read that verse would have said end, end of the world if you have an old King James version or something like that. Uh, but the actual translation is end of the age okay it's not the end of the world and so we will look at it in romans 11:25, and it says uh, for i would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles come in now when we look at this there's an end of an age coming we found something unique uh, here that hasn't occurred for uh, the first 2,000 years. Only in the first instance when the church began to grow how, has it happened for 2,000 years. We have not seen what we're seeing today. And what we're looking at is, of course, when they first became um, Jews, it was salvation was of the Jews. And so we have 
uh, 3,000 Jews getting uh, converted to their Messiah uh, in the book of Acts. And then from there it grows and they were instructed to start where? In Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So when the apostles went, Paul went to the, the synagogues first, okay? So we'd visit Corinth and Ephesus, Galatia, all these places. He went to the synagogues first because salvation was of the Jews. We have the Jews coming in. But after a time period, then we've come in, the Gentiles are grafted in, particularly under the ministry of Paul um, and Apollos. They come in and they minister the Gentiles. From there, we have 2,000 years where Gentile after Gentile uh, becomes converted to Jesus Christ. You can go on any uh, continent on the planet. They know who Jesus Christ is and you'll find followers of Jesus on that continent. We've got uh, South American uh, converts. We've got American converts, Canadian converts. You've got Alaskan converts. We've got Russian converts. We've got uh, Turkish converts. We've got British converts. We've got uh, Greek converts, we've got Italian converts, of course, we've got African converts, uh, we've got Indonesian converts, we've got Pacific Island, Samoan, Fiji converts. There's not, not a country in the world where you can go, even closed countries, where there's not a follower of Jesus Christ there, which of course is a, uh, a fulfillment of Matthew 28, 14, where he says, I'll preach this gospel and this gospel will go around the world. And then, of course, the end will come. And so this gospel has gone around the world and, uh, and Gentiles have believed. But we're seeing something unique in our time frame. What are we seeing? We're seeing uh, in the last 50 years more Jews come to Jesus Christ, acknowledging their Messiah, becoming Messianic Jews, than in the last 50 years, than in the preceding 2,000 years, once that initial surge happened, uh, with the church. so uh, And of course that's consistent with Romans 11 because we have the natural branches and then we've got the Gentile branch, the wild olive tree that's grafted in and then as that becomes apostate it says listen don't boast against the natural branches because they can easily be grafted in again. So we've got uh, a period here where salvation is of the Jews, the Gentiles are grafted in, then the Jews come after that. What we're seeing is this, this close of the age, the fullness of the Gentiles, Romans 11.25. The closing of this age is coming because in our lifetime we're seeing the natural branches getting grafted in. We see of the Gentile church that it's becoming apostate, that it's, it's coming, it's dis, it's declining no matter what they tell you the growth in these mega churches is mainly from transfer growth from stealing it from other um, uh, fellowships and so we're not really seeing true growth particularly in the United Kingdom where you got three churches a week closing and mosques opening up uh, it's growing faster uh, than any other religion in those so the West is declining the West is declining um, in that way um, other areas are surging, but, but on the whole, um, we've got to be honest with the statistics. We've got the age of the Gentiles is closing, but however, in Israel, more and more Jews are finding their way to their Messiah. That is unique, has never happened in 2,000 years, and so that's where we are. Also, when we look at the parable that we've just read, it says to let down the net, the drag net at the end of the, day, of the age. We let it down on the right side, okay, the right side of the ship. Now, what is the right side? What is it? And so we read in Psalm 110, verse 1 and verse 2, a verse that is quoted um, twice, as from my knowledge, in the New Testament, and of course, in Psalm 110, it's quoted there. It's the very verse that Jesus refused to answer the question regarding John the Baptist um, because he said, you, I want you first to answer this question regarding this. And it says this, uh, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make my enemies my full footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion and rule you in the midst of your enemies. The right hand is the, the seat of authority and the seat of power. And in Psalm 110, it's linked to the destruction of the enemies. Okay, it's not just authority, it's the power of God to subdue his enemies. And so when they let down the net on the right hand side, uh, of the boat, what that means is there's going to be a, t a forcible, there's going to be a, a bringing in a dragnet uh, uh, where God brings everybody in. 
okay? So, and of course, we're talking about the end of the age here where he divides the good uh, from the bad. And so he brings them in and he makes distinction there. So the, the, um, the good fish, if you like, the kosher, kosher fish are lifted up and there's a distinction uh, between those that are on the shore and those that are left behind. And so we have this going on, these, these plays. But the right-hand side where they let down the net, that's the right hand of authority. Not just authority, but of power to subdue his enemies. And so that's the dragnet that we're looking at here. Also, we have the, the picture here of Peter with his garment. And so um, uh, the garment that we're looking at, a very odd scenario where Peter um, says, hey, well, uh, you know, it's, it's the Lord. And so he decides to put a garment on and swim. Uh, we would do the opposite, of course. You go on the boat, you recognize someone on the shore, you want to get to them quickly. You're not going to put a garment on that's going to slow you down in the ocean. But, uh, but in Peter's case, he puts this garment on. What's the picture that's going on here? What's the picture? Well, Isaiah 61, among other uh, scriptures tells us what this garment is to represent. 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay? Uh, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and a bride adoreth herself with jewels. And so we have the garment the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness. And the picture is, of course, that as this kingdom is breaking through, as this age is coming upon us, that we need to put on the garment of salvation. That's the thing that's, as we, and draw closer to Jesus. We put on the garment of salvation and we head in the direction of Jesus. And so, um, so this is the picture that's coming out, of course. As the day is just about breaking, we have a picture here of, Peter putting on the garment of salvation and heading towards Jesus, and so uh, we've got to direct. Uh, uh, we've got to be looking at evangelism even at these points in time, and we've got to be honest as well because um, we have a situation where uh, the nets have to be cleaned, and so uh, say the ministry of John, we have him, and where he's called, uh, there is something that I explored a little bit where. When someone is called, I think Bill Randalls might have put me onto this, he said, um, the way that the, the, one of the apostles or disciples are called uh, gives you a large hint as to what their ministry's co content's going to be. So with John, um, and they're, they're found cleaning the nets. And then we read, of course, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, He's doing the same thing. He's saying, this is how you know you can be saved. Therefore, you, you can be a fisher of men here because of these things in that 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He is cleaning the nets, making the church ready to fish again. And so we've got to ask ourselves uh, with our evangelistic programs, do our nets need to be cleaned? Why is it that we're not catching fish? Is there something wrong with the net? Does it need to be cleaned? Is there sin in the camp? What is going on? Are we running programs and not the evangelism that Jesus has called for where he directs where the net should come down? We've got to consider all these things, be honest. There's another thing in these parables that we look at, and that's Jesus's, uh, he's looking at, Come and eat breakfast, okay? So after they, get, they bring that on, uh, and this, of course, it's not a Passover meal, but it is a picture of a Passover meal. It's the marriage supper of the lamb is what we're talking about here. And so um, uh, this is the, the, the hint of what we look at when, when this net comes in. <coughs> and this should give us a hint as to the timing and sequence of events. Okay, when the net comes in, the fish are divided. Then he chooses the, some of the kosher fish because as the fish come in, there will be kosher fish and non-kosher fish. They had to have fish with scales and fins that would be able to be eaten. Other fish that were not of that persuasion to be caught in the net, they had to be uh, separated out. They were not wholesome to eat and so for a Jew. And so we have this going on. Now, in the, to this end, we read uh, Revelation 19. And so we'll go quickly to that if we can. And Revelation 19, I just want to read uh, the chapter to you. It says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot he has judged them 
who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise God and all you, his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, uh, being the nations, and sound of the mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the, uh, for the fine linen is the righteous axe, going back to the righteous robe that we were talking about before, the garment of salvation. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who, call, uh, who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not. I am your fellow servant and your, of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now listen, now in Revelation 19, those first 10 verses are one section. Then it changes to a different section. Let's go through it. Verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he... Uh, who sat on him was called Faithful and True. So the horse is now coming. I thought in the first 10, Jesus was already there. there. But anyway, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and he had on his cr head many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. So at this point in this, this, this section, he has not yet judged the nations, has not struck them, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So he hasn't yet, in this verse, tread out the, uh, the winepress of his wrath. Um, so we have that. Um, which is the judgment of God, of course. The, the, okay, so, and he has on his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So this is Armageddon in here, okay, which is obviously ha happened if we're going to the, the other bit. So uh, let's keep going. And I saw a beast, the kings on the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him, the false prophet who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who deceived the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, those too were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And when we see in the parables there, we have Jesus kindling a fire uh, in John 21. And then also in that Matthew 13, we have the same thing where they're cast in the fire there. Okay. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all of the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, there's two ways we can look at this, uh, this section here. Uh, when we read uh, Revelation 19, if we, if we believe Revelation was written in sequ sequential order, okay, so you listen to someone like John Hagee or something like that, he'll, he says it's sequential. So we read the book and each chapter gives you another sequence of what's going to follow from the previous chapter. That's the way he believes it's read. So we need to investigate that claim as to whether that is correct or not, because if you follow that, you may end up with some interesting places or in the amount of judgments and who's going to be a, um, uh, you know, the, how many beasts and all this sort of stuff. So we need to be careful as far as that. So we need to test that hypothesis. I want to show you now clearly from the Word of God uh, whether or not Revelation is written sequentially or it's written where I see this and then I see that and then God shows me this and God shows me that but it may not be in sequential order. It may in some cases, in some parts, be sequential uh, as it runs and other parts where 
I saw this and then I saw that and I saw this, but he's seeing things as God shows it to him, but not necessarily sequentially. So turn in your Bibles to Revelation 14. We want to have a look at that. Revelation 14, and we're going to start with that. Now, Revelation 14 starts in verse number one. It says, And then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now just start with the first couple of lines of verse number one. Jesus, I hope, hopefully we all agree that the second coming of Jesus has come when his feet are standing in that place on Mount Zion, okay? So the lamb standing on Mount Zion, his feet physically touching this earth, Jesus has returned. That's verse one. Okay, we're going to keep reading though. And I heard a voice, verse two, and I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the thunder, voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps and they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000, those who were redeemed. And these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without fault before the, the throne of God. So all of this is all about like Revelation 19, 1 to 10. We read there's similar characters happening here. And so... Then I saw, verse 6, then I saw another angel flying in the midst. So I saw this and then I saw this. So Jesus came back in those, those verses up to verse 5 and Jesus' feet are standing on the Mount of Olives. Now we go to verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and pe people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs and waters. Do you honestly believe that after Jesus' feet touched this earth, that he, there's a gospel to be preached? The gospel's to be preached in this dispensation of grace, and the message of the gospel is an everlasting one. It goes rings throughout from the cross onwards. No problem with that. But when Jesus comes back, it's for judgment. Okay, it's not for a gospel to be preached. And so we have a, a mixing of things going on there. Then in verse 8, we have another one. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations bring, drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then we say, okay, well, Jesus has already come. Has Babylon not been fallen before he came? And so uh, then we have that going on there. And then a third angel followed saying, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So do we believe that when Jesus comes back and his feet touches Mount Zion, that they're going to have people there that are there after that event going to start worshipping the beast and receive the, beast, the mark of the beast. We see that that's not sequential to scripture, okay? And, uh, and so we could go on and on and on there, but it just it shows that there's, he sees something and then he sees something else and God shows him a bit about the beast and then a bit about the mark and then he shows him another scene and it's like seeing scenes but they're not sequential okay I hope you see that from from uh, Revelation 14 so that becomes uh, important okay there's another another thing we want to have a look at here when we looked at the fish coming in there was there's something about the fish. There's a number there uh, of, um, and I remember speaking to a, a pastor of one of the churches here, and he said, uh, Paul, do you know anything about this number? He must have been preaching on this or something like that. And he said, uh, the number is 153. And I said, uh, at that stage, I had no idea. And I said, listen, I think that's the only number in Scripture that is not interpreted. The scripture, we need scripture to interpret scripture. And so oftentimes we will see numbers and we can derive the meaning of them, not from outside sources or from sorcery or a Kabbalah or anything on those lines. What we're talking about is uh, we're talking, the scripture shows you the meaning. But in the case of 153, you will not find that anywhere else in the Bible. At that stage I said, listen, um, I have no idea what that number is. I think it's the only number in the Bible that's not interpreted. And so um, that was my message at the time. Since then, um, if we can just turn in our Bibles, we go to 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings, 
and uh, since then I've found uh, a compelling meaning which I'd, uh, I think the 153 is most certainly talking about. So 2 Kings chapter 1, 2 Kings 1, and we're going to start at verse 9, and we're going to do some elementary mathematics here. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So let's do a quick sum here. We're going to have a captain plus 50 equals what? 51. Okay, so that's uh, First Kings, uh, Second Kings, sorry, chapter one, verse nine, and it says, um, "So he went up on, uh, went up to him." And sorry, the context of this is that the northern kingdom has become apostate, and so the king of Samaria, which is in the north, they're worshiping at wrong sites. They're worshiping false gods. Uh, idolatry is rife, and so Elijah comes along here. And uh, they, the, the, the king sent these, this captain and 50 to Elijah here. And so um, he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men so another horde comes down one plus another 50 equals I hope you got the answer right <laughs> all right so uh, th then he's 50 comes then he sent to him another captain with 50 and 50 men and then he answered and said to him man of God thus the king has said come down quickly and so Elijah answered and said to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And again he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. One captain plus 50 men equals 51. Let's finish the verse. Uh, came and uh, and the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with the man and said to him man of God please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight look fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s and uh, with their 50s but let my life now be precious in your sight and the angel of the Lord said to Elijah go down with him and do not be afraid. So he arose and went down with him um, uh, to the king. So we have, let's do some elementary maths. One, two, three. One, two, three of those three fives. There we got five there. Carry the one. And it's 153 is what we were talking about before. That is the number. Now, when we look at this number, uh, there's a verse in Hosea 5.15 that says this, uh, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face and they earnestly seek me. Then there's another verse in Zechariah 12 verse 10 that says, and I will pour on the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they will look on me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and he shall be in bitterness to him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. What we have going on here is the 153 specifically relates to the Jews. Okay, and it's no coincidence that in the, that Second Kings chapter one verse nine onwards that it was the last group of three that were declared to be his servants. The first two were trying to give orders and were consumed by fire. And so we had 51, 51, and that 51 that actually is spared. So what's going to come on? Uh, what, we are going to have a replay of all this going on, the 153. At the time where the dragnet comes in, okay, Jacob wrestles all the way through the night until the morning breaks. Okay, so the Jews are going to go all the way through the 153, but what is going to happen to the Jew? Well, it's easy. What's going to happen to the Jew is we're going to have um, in Zechariah 13, chapter 8, 
I think it says. Let's let's find Jack, Zechariah uh, 13, if I can, just quickly. I probably should have had this marked or something, but anyway, that's, I think it's verse 8. Yes, and it says this. We're going to have a replay of exactly what's going on here. Zechariah prophesying, it says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds... Two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. Okay? One third shall be left in it. I will bring the one third through what? The fire, the judgment. Okay? I'm not going to judge by water. He's going to judge by fire the second time. And so he says, I'm going to refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. Just like we read in Zechariah 12, just like we read in verse 10, and also Hosea 5.15, where he says, I'm going to return to my place until they... Uh, acknowledge their offense, their iniquity, and they're also going to call on my name. They're going to seek my face. They're going to earnestly seek my face. And it says there in, in Zechariah uh, 13 verse 9, he says, They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, This is my people. And each one will say, The Lord is my God. Okay, be aware that what's going to happen, everyone's excited that you know Israel's been established the Jews been brought back and you got all sorts of ministries out there that want to help the Jew and uh, that's a good thing you know who blesses my people will be blessed he who curses them be cursed no problem with that they, but we've got to acknowledge this that the Jews have been brought back into the land for the final judgment that's got judgment has always caused uh, been um, uh, fallen upon the Jew in thirds, in thirds. Ezekiel, I think it was, that had to, or Jeremiah had to separate the, the hairs into thirds and tuck a third into his, into his uh, garment, that was which was hid, or a few remnants were hid in there. Then we have also like the Holocaust, where uh, two-thirds of European Jewry and one-third in total uh, Jewry was wiped off the planet in the Holocaust there. And so we've got thirds are always the judgment for the Jew, but in its final analysis, there is two-thirds that are going to uh, be, be judged by God. And you say, well, what's going to happen now? You know, when Armageddon's going on, we've got the judgment of the Gentile nations that have all gathered themselves against uh, uh, the very place that, uh, that God's put his name. They gathered around there. Uh, and he's going to judge them in the valley of, uh, well, they're going to assemble on Megiddo. They're going to get down into the valley and be judged there. But what's happening at the same time there is that in the valley of uh, Hinnom, we're going to have judgment fall upon. Jeremiah 7 tells us that we're going to have judgment in there uh, because they have offered their children uh, to Molech. Okay, the amount of abortions that have occurred in Israel is horrendous. And so God, the cup of his anger is being filled. And at the very time he's going to judge the Gentile nations, he is also going to judge the Jews there. And what will be left is one third of them that will be his servants. They will call upon his name. They will acknowledge him as their Messiah. And in that day, the scripture, all Israel shall be saved, will be correct because the one third that will survive will be his servants. Now, I just want to finish with one extra thing here. When we looked at the parable there, there was a funny little bit that said the boat was out from the shore. How far? 200 cubits, okay, is where it was out. And so we want to have a look at that. The way we want to dissect that is in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, it says, But if our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of his glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. So who is blinding them? It's the God of this world. Satan is blinding them okay satan's blinding them but we said read this in romans 11 let's turn there romans 11 25 i think that's one of the scriptures that we said right at the beginning uh whoops where are we romans romans here we go it's coming oops i've skipped past it again here we go here we go okay romans 11 
and verse 25 we start there again it says this it says for i do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part he said i don't want you to be unaware that blindness in part in part so the blindness will be taken away but for this moment for the dispensation of the gentiles till the fullness of the gentiles comes in there's a blindness that has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles has come in and so all israel will be saved as it is written etc etc that goes on there so we have a blindness that's happened to israel but what's the cause of that blindness the blindness is the god of this world has put a shroud over them okay they they can't see it they can't see it and so um so they can't they can't make any of that the gifts of god it says as concerning the gospel they are enemies for your sakes verse 28 but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, okay? For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gift of the covenants to this, the Jewish people uh, is without repentance. It cannot be revoked, okay? They're their gifts and the calling that he is their chosen people. As believers, we are his children, but they are his chosen people, okay? He, they're the lens through which everyone else observes and sees the character of God okay when we go through life there's two trials that happen and so we need to be aware of the source of our trials and uh, where these things come from and my contention you may have heard this before is that 10 equals a trial that is uh, at least animated by the devil okay and then we have another one which is 40, which is a divine trial. Whoops. Okay. Where do we see this? You say, Paul, where are you getting all this rubbish from? Well, we look at uh, God's, uh, how God initiates the trial. God leads the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt into the wilderness how long were they there 40 years 40 years okay so we have that going on moses was led up to get the law uh written on two tablets of stone but before that how long was he up there for 40 days and 40 nights okay david reigned uh commenced his reign at 30 years of age and reigned for 40 years okay a reign that is uh, was ordained of god but was a trial a test to him uh, which he did struggle with with some of the things that happened also jonah um, gets coughed up on a beach in nineveh somewhere uh, and it's no wonder they repented because if a big fish landed on the coast and spat out a man with all his clothes rotting off and uh, the first words out of his mouth was uh, god's going to bring the hammer down on you and how long have you got you've got 40 days now if you don't believe jonah was a god thing jonah was running in the opposite direction god brought him to the shores of nineveh so that he could preach repentance or preach the judgment of god and they didn't know god was going to abstain from the hammer and neither did jonah but the, the amount of time period that was given was 40 days it was a divine trial for nineveh then also we've got things like noah where uh, he was it was god that closed the door on the ark but after God closes the door on them, then they go through 40 days and 40 nights of rain after that. So he also goes through a trial. When you see the, um, the initiation of Jesus' ministry, he says he was, after he's baptized, he's led into the, by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days. And when he's finished, he comes out in the power of the Spirit. Okay? Um, and Jesus showed himself for 40 days post-resurrection, uh, infallible proofs of who he was. And so we have 40 is definitely divine trials, okay? 10, we say, is the trials of Satan. How do we get that? Well, if you look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3, and it says, um, uh, not 10, sorry, 2 verse 10, and it says that... Um, for fear none of these things he's talking obviously to the churches of revelation here uh, one of the seven churches and he says fear none of the things which you shall suffer behold the devil will cast you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation for 
10 days. Be thy faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. What's happening is yeah, the promise to this church is that you're going to go through 10 days of tribulation. Through much tribulation will you enter into the kingdom is what the Bible says. And so we're going to come to a power to a time here where we have uh, a sifting of the church okay but it's going to be satanically animated you read the book of Daniel and it says that power is going to be given uh, to this man Jesus had three and a half years in this earth uh, this antichrist this coming world re leader uh, is also going to have equal time of three and a half years and in that time he's going to be satanically empowered and it says in Daniel he's going to make war on the saints and he's going to overcome them Okay, so we're heading into rough waters. That is a satanically animated uh, trial. How do we know about this 10? Well, when we look at the dragon himself, okay? The, not, the, not the deceiver, which is the serpent, but the dragon, okay? The persecutor uh, the, this is the two characters of Satan. And it says in Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns. Okay, so when we look at it, there's a statue. Um, I'm not sure where it is. A statue of Moses, and it may be Michelangelo that actually carved the thing. And um, when you look at the statue of Moses, he's got two horns coming out. What's the horns? The horns is um, the power. It's power is what it is. And so what we're going to be looking at here when he says about the dragon, the great red dragon, the persecutor, uh, the the satanic persecutor of the church uh, this person that 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 entity sorry not this person but that entity has 10 horns it's satanic power it's demonic power is what it is satanic okay and so he's full of that power it's uh, 10 horns okay but also then we have from that in Revelation 13 verse 1 so just a chapter on from that we have the situation where that red dragon has animated two things and there's a beast that rises up out of the sea out of the nations and he has seven heads and ten horns same thing that leader is going to be satanically animated and it's going to be a trial for every Christian in that day or every believer in that day is going to find it very hard Laban changes Jacob's wages uh, ten times ten brothers went down to Egypt to buy corn the children of Israel tempted God ten times uh, before the hammer fell on them. Ha Haman, a very picture of the Antichrist, has ten sons. And uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that at the end we have uh, ten virgins, uh, the parable going there, where the church, and just like we spoke about the birds and the mustard seed, is allowing doctrines in there uh, that are satanically animated. They're putting up, they're making compromise after compromise on the Word of God to such an extent that we see uh, all sorts of unrighteous and unholy relationships between uh, the, the leaders and the people of God. I would never have imagined that you could go to a women's conference uh, and uh, like they did in New York and find a man standing on stage unclothed but for a guitar. This is a Christian women's conference and also in that, that interlude you have a man with a beard dressed up as the Statue of Liberty, Liberty which is obviously a female entity and a pagan one at that. And these things are at a women's Christian conference, I don't understand. And then we have um, that was in New York uh, Hillsong and then also we have uh, they come over from uh, for the conference and after the Hillsong conference um, Carl Lentz uh, the pastor of the New York Hillsong uh, Assembly and Justin Bieber his, um, his uh, associate there that came over to give the, some notoriety to the conference and they stop in New Zealand and in a bar there they were filmed uh, where they were drinking shots at the bar, Bebo is obviously uh, getting such a state of intoxication that he's uh, sufficiently comfortable to take off his shirt in public and and um, have some lewd behaviour with the barmaid at that stage. All of which Carl Lentz was present for. These things are not to be tolerated in the word, of, you know, by the word of God. This should not be in the leadership. Uh, and they're just some examples. There's miles of examples. But what's happening? The birds are in the top of the tree and we're having 
10 virgins, we're having those sort of doctrines come through. My worry is that all 10 virgins, all those who were there to proclaim the coming of the bridegroom, were all asleep at the end, all asleep. And so that's a worry for me. So we've got uh, those going on there. And uh, so in the last days, we're going to have this. We're going to have 200 cubits. And through much tribulation and particularly satanically animated uh, opposition, we're going to have, and so we have 2,000 is the number that we're looking at there. If that's true, that would be consistent with uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, which is specifically talking about eschatology or the last days. It says one day is as a thousand years uh, for that. And we have things like um, where we have uh, an unfulfilled prophecy that says, uh, we, Jesus talking to Herod and says, uh, today um, I will uh, heal, cast out devils today and tomorrow. And the third day will be perfected. So if Second Peter chapter 3 is right, that's 2,000 years. Okay, if a day is as that. Then we've got also things like in Joshua chapter 3, where the ark is going across from Jordan, from the wilderness into the promised land. The ark goes over first. And Jesus, obviously, as our first fruits, he's gone over first. But how far was the distance between the ark and the, and the entourage coming? It was about 2,000 cubits, okay, about 2,000 cubits. So the ark crosses over, and about 2,000 cubits later, then they cross over. So it's consistent with the 2,000-year type thing. So therefore, we believe that the coming of this kingdom is imminent, imminent. And so, and there's many other examples of that, which may may find on my other teachings as to why we believe that it, that it is imminent. But uh, needless to say, this that we believe the kingdom is breaking through, and uh, so this parable about the dragnet coming in will give us some idea of the sequence of the marriage supper of the lamb, that type of thing, where we think the marriage supper is going to be. Uh, well, some people believe that the marriage supper occurs. Uh, when the rapture occurs, if you believe in pre-tribulation at the start of the seven years, and then all these events occur, and uh, while that happens, then we come back with Jesus after the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's how they would see that. Uh, this parable would tend to indicate that the fish are uh, gathered by power and authority. All the fish come in. Some of the fish are taken to eaten. That was consistent with both parables. Uh, not all the fish. The fish were separated. In the first one, in the dragnet, John chapter 21, he says, bring some of the fish, which means others are left behind. And so the fish are sorted into kosher, that which is uh, able to be consumed and eaten and become one with that which, person with, 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 that is eating it. And others that were unfit for human consumption. And so they were cast aside. And the day is coming quickly upon us where there'll be a division of that thing. But for the marriage supper of the land, that has already come in. The dragnet comes in, the sorting occurs, and then the supper occurs. Okay, just with the fires, the fires there at the same time, the supper. And we tend to see from other parables where the man comes in with the wedding garment on into the feast and says, hey, uh, what are you doing here without a garment on? He gets thrown out. That gives us some indication that there'll be that maybe some of the fish that are non-kosher will see what they could have had, but it will be too late and that will torment them forevermore. What they could have had, what they should have had, but what has been completely lost. I pray that you're not one of those people. Today is the day of salvation. Be like Peter. Put on the garment of salvation and dive in and get closer and closer to Jesus as the day occurs. Put on that robe of righteousness. Ask Jesus into your life. He'll change it forever. God bless you.